Yeah, it's good to see everybody. Good to celebrate Thanksgiving. I hope you'll have a chance to be with other folks. And thanks to the Granadians who've gotten involved in hosting international students. Today we take that step, first step in looking at where the leaders have charted the direction of the church for next year. We talked about it a little bit two weeks ago. And today we sort of take big picture and begin to look in more detail for us. And then the next week, a little bit even more detail, a little more granular. So I hope you'll enjoy this journey. And you've seen it expressed. You saw it in the video, Live Out Grace. We're going to talk about why that is our calling, what that looks like as we're going forward. Okay, and I'm going to read um, a very pivotal passage from the Old Testament. We won't pick apart every little bit of it, and, but I will explain what it's trying to teach us about that, so where it's leading us. So if you'll follow along with me, again, it's in your program, it's here on the wall, um, it'll probably be helpful to follow along because this is a difficult text as well. This is the Word of God. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like a bird. The beast had four heads. And it was given authority to rule. After that in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast. Terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts. And it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. The the three horn, the three of the first horns, I'm sorry, were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. Then I continued to watch, because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into a blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. 
He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, as we read this passage and we try to envision this image that you gave Daniel, I pray, Father, that you will enable us to see not just back to that vision you gave him, but also into the present where we live and to the future in your purposes for life. Father, we want to be a part of that. You created us and you've given us this little space in history in which to inhabit, in which to live. And so, Father, I pray that you'll show us our part, what it means to be your people right here at Granada, in this city, in this year, and what it means to follow Jesus. And we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. How, how will Jesus save the world? I mean, that's how we talk about it. That's how Christians have talked about it. It's been passed along. But you ever think about, like, practically, I mean, how will this actually come about and happen in history? You ever give a thought to how that might actually unfold? Not long ago, Diane Modestini, that's her name, was given an interesting job. Here's a picture of Diane. She is one of the great restorers of art alive in the world today. It seems that a man named Robert Simon, a, an art collector and dealer, brought to her a, a small a painting that he wanted her to restore. That painting dates back maybe to the 1500s or the 1400s, not so sure, and it originally had been, it had been passed around from one collector to another after it was sold in an auction in 1958. And here's the thing, Diane's husband, Mario, has recently passed away. And as she worked with that painting, she said two big things happened to her. First, as an expert with the masters, she was looking at the detail of the brushstrokes. And by the way, in this painting, only about 50% of the original color and the original painting existed. But as she especially looked at the curls in the locks of the hair of the subject, and then a moment came when she was painting in the lost detail of the upper lip, she just had this realization. She said, I came to the conclusion this must be Leonardo. No one else could have painted it. Now, by the way, we only have about 20 paintings of the Italian master Leonardo da Vinci. Likely, you're familiar with this one, the, par the uh, painting of the Last Supper. It's by far the most famous of all of his paintings, but think this master left us only about 20. And it was also known that he had painted a picture of Jesus, but it was believed lost a few hundred years ago. But remember, I told you two things happened to Diane as she was restoring this painting. And that I mentioned that she had also lost her husband, Mario, also a restorer of paintings. And as she looked at Jesus in this painting, she said, the beauty of his face was so compelling that it helped me through a difficult time. It wasn't just that the painting grew on her, it was as if she started to bond with the character in the painting. By the way, at that auction all those years ago in 1958, the winner of the bid on that painting paid 45 pounds, the equivalent of a little over $100. Now, I don't know if it's a real Da Vinci or not, but this week at auction it sold for $450 million. And I don't know if you know, but the title of that painting is Salvatore Mundi. Do you know what that means in Italian? It literally means the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. So if this is da Vinci, I don't know if it is, it, I think it may be, 
The question is, what was he communicating? What was he saying he believed about the Savior of the world? Now, interestingly enough, I want to look at it again. You'll notice that in in the character's left hand, this Jesus is holding a little orb of crystal. Now, this is super important because it's a powerful metaphor, and it's not just for our world, but it is more expansive in scope than that. It is connected both to eternity and the whole of creation, not just the earth. So the message of this is this this one who is Jesus, he holds all of this in his hands, and he is the Savior of the world. How does Jesus become the Savior of the world? What What does that mean? How will it be fulfilled? And let me say today, I don't believe this is a theoretical question. I also don't believe it's primarily a theological question. I believe it's actually a practical question. And here's why. If you belong to Christ, you are part of his kingdom. Then you join with Jesus in his work. You follow him as a part of his kingdom. And the question is then, what does that look like? How is Jesus in real time in our world in practical ways going to be the Savior, is the Savior of our world. What I believe is this, how you see Jesus changing the world will determine how you live in the world, what you do every day, and how you live your life. Now, Now, here's the problem as I read this and think about this. We don't really think in this way, right? We just don't. We don't think about where history is going a whole lot. And we actually don't think much about where we have come from. It's as if we've isolated ourselves in this, on this little island in the middle of an immense sea and we, all we can feel and think about is right now. So we push through another day. So following Jesus means, okay, well, maybe I pray sometimes and I go to church every now and then. But I don't really feel that I'm a part of something bigger. And I I certainly don't see this, Jesus, the Savior of our world. And by the way, we know that Jesus went to the cross and he died for sin and he rose from the dead. So so, So today I really want to begin with perspective to see, well, what is God doing and how has God planned in Jesus to save the world? Now, you might say, well, what benefit could perspective have? How will this help me as I live? I like to tell the story of a man one day, a few, I don't know how long ago, 100 years ago, he's walking through a, a stone quarry. And as he was doing that, there were workers who with chisels were cutting the stones going to be used in a construction project. And as he walked along, he asked the first man who was working there, he said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm cutting out stones. And he thought about that, and he kept walking through this stone quarry as more people were cutting out stones. And he asked the second man, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm building building a wall. And he kept walking past that. And as he passed through the quarry, he, he came to another man, and he also asked him. He said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral to the glory of God. And the amazing thing about those three workers, they were all doing exactly the same physical labor in that stone quarry, but they each had a completely different perspective of what their mission was. You see, in other words, the perspective you have of what you're doing every day and and why you're here and what you're a part of will determine how, how you go about everything. And this is the way Jesus begins to work in his people as they go out and live into the world, as we, what we call living out grace. And that's what I want to talk with you about a little bit today. I want to give all of us the most important to pers- perspective to begin with. Now, I've just read from the book of Daniel, and this is one of the most important passages in the entire Old Testament, the Older Testament. 
This guy, Daniel, lived at a time about 500 years before Jesus was even born. And it was a time when the state of the Jewish people was about as bad as it has ever been. Their main city, Jerusalem, had been destroyed. Their whole nation had been conquered. And many of them had lost everything that they had. It was a horrible time. And as they looked at the history, they asked what often we ask. How could God be in control? What is God doing in the world? I mean, are we really sure that God is at work in control of all of this? And Daniel was this distinguished Jewish man who had been taken off to Babylon by the king when his country was conquered, and he was put into the service of the king. And he was a brilliant young man. He was so bright that as he grew in his career, he became almost what we would think of as the prime minister of Babylon. And during that time, Daniel was asking the question that we're asking today. What is God doing in the world? And and why are these things happening that are happening? And so God gave Daniel a vision in the middle of the night in the form of a dream to explain to him about unfolding history before and after him. In that, in that vision, we're told Daniel saw four great beasts, each different from the others, that came up out of the sea. Now, no doubt, Daniel in this vision experienced both fear, terror, and joy, as we will see. And here's how it sort of unfolded. Out of the winds of history that blew up the sea, the water, these four beasts emerge that represent the kingdoms of the world from this turbulent time in history. Now these four animals are all predators. There's a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the fourth that is the most vicious of all, uh, some animal with iron teeth. This is an artist rendering from about 400 years ago of that picture of what Daniel might have seen. Now, each one of these empires ruled the world with power and authority. Each had vast armies, and they removed their enemies and destroyed other nations. They made slaves of people, and they controlled life. As it's described here, these these animals were like wild, they, they were like raging beasts, out to devour their prey at will. We know about them. A lion has immense strength and power. And we know that Babylon as a nation where Daniel is, they could bring one million soldiers to the field for a battle. That's amazing. Bears are known to have voracious appetites. And the leopard was considered one of the most dangerous because it swift and sudden attacks. But the beast with the iron teeth How could it be stopped? It's going to consume everything in its way. And as we hear these things with Daniel, we would think, where is God? Where is he? And how could God allow be allowing these things to happen in history? And notice what Daniel sees in his vision. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. The river, a river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. Yes, the Lord is also here. And the amazing thing is his power is never in doubt. These flames that flow like a river represent the judgment of God. And it's a picture of the judge taking his seat. And the written evidence is all in those books that are being opened. And there are thousands upon thousands that are serving him and standing before him. And you'll notice while there are many thrones, only one is said to be occupied, the Lord himself. And what Daniel is being told is, all of these things are happening in the world and they're going to happen, but no matter what you see, you need to know that God is king. He rules and he reigns over all of this. And there will be a judgment for the nations, 
for their brutality and for the crimes they commit. It will happen because the Lord will take care of this. And so from the onset, here Daniel is given this encouraging picture that that the Lord is the true reigning king over all of the chaos of history. And he is in control even when when it may not appear to you that he is. And again, this must strike hope in Daniel's heart. And it would do the same in us. In, in our world, I mean, how can we not have a sober outlook on the unfolding events of history? If we're honest about life, there are days when we wonder, who is in charge of this? And wow, is God really reigning over this? Is, is he sovereign over all things? If we're honest, that's what we'll begin to feel. And we'll wonder, will injustice continue going on forever? But even the empire of Rome, thought to be this beast with iron teeth, is, is not invincible and indestructible. It too came under judgment and it lost power. But I wonder, is, is that your p- posture? Do you believe that God is king over history? That he has power over all things in our world? Or have we given up life and really given up on hope? You see, because I believe that it's the hope that sustains us as we follow Christ every day. Or I'd put it like this, you will live within your hope in the way that you live. Um, You say, well, well, how can that be true? Well, Sandy and I lived in New Jersey for over 15 years, and when we did, we lived close to this reservoir, it's called Round Valley, and I love to go sailing there. And as we would go there and enjoy, it was like a recreation place, I learned the history of the two valleys that were flooded to make that reservoir. What happened is the Army Corps of Engineers, I believe, came in and they bought up the land and they went to the people who had houses. They were like a little village there. They bought up all of the property, but this is what they did. They said, look, it's probably going to take us about five years to build the dams and to flood the valley Look, we bought the house, but you can continue to live in it if you want. And so people stayed in those houses. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were living in one of those houses, do you think you made repairs during that time? If you were living in one of those houses, do you think you painted the house during that time? You think you were going to fix those things that were broken unless you absolutely have to? See, you knew where things were going, and as a result of that, it determined how you were going to live in that house. And that's the reality of hope and perspective in our world. You see, where you believe all of this is going and what you believe is happening will determine how you invest and and how you serve and how you live and what you do. And Daniel's story tells us that it matters what we do here. That the world is not going to hell in a handbasket, as my grandmother used to explain it. But God's plan is a plan to redeem. That in the middle of this chaos of the nations, God is present and he will bring judgment. He will bring his kingdom here. And you know, that's why we pray in that prayer as Jesus taught us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not, Lord, hey, take me to heaven because this world's going to hell. It's let your kingdom Come here where we live. So you say, well, when will that come? How is that going to happen? Well, here's what Daniel has shown in his vision. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You see, in the middle of this scene of judgment and the chaos of these nations that are devouring the people of the earth, in walks in this very subtle figure who looks like a man. He's called the Son of Man. But clearly, he is more than that, because all authority is being given to him by God himself. He he is like God because everyone is worshiping him, and he has a kingdom too. But his kingdom 
is an unending kingdom. It's never going to pass away. And as you read this, you're like, wow. At, a time, at this time, Daniel had no idea who might, this might be. He had no idea who this son of man was. And by the way, for those hundreds of years, the Jewish people debated and pondered this. Who is this person? Who even God gives him all authority and power. And people worship him as God. This amazing picture that we're given here. Then Jesus came. And the most common title used for Jesus in the Gospels is the Son of Man like Daniel saw in his vision. And here's the thing. Let me tell you a little more about the picture. You see, the Jewish people looked at those kingdoms, what the, the, you know, the lion and the bear and the leopard and the, the kingdom that was the, the, the beast with iron teeth, and they believed that each successive kingdom to take power had to have more might, had to have larger armies, had to have greater war machines, and so they, you can imagine, they thought the coming of the Son of Man, what it was going to be like. He would have to take power from the beast with, that had iron teeth from Rome. He would be a mighty conqueror, a deliverer who would destroy his enemies. And wow, would there be a terrific battle, and they would be victorious. But Jesus was none of what they expected. He didn't conquer as they hoped. How could he be that guy from the book of Daniel? He didn't ride a war horse, but a peaceful donkey on the day of his triumph. And he, on the day of his triumph, it ended with him in, in tears. He could not be this man, the one God told Daniel about. And here's what happened. After Jesus was arrested during that week and brought before the chief priests and leaders of the people, they, they brought in false witnesses to, to accuse Jesus, and they pressed Jesus to declare who he was, whether he was the chosen one. Again, the high priest asked him, the Gospel of Mark tells us, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Oh my goodness, he's quoting from Daniel. And he's saying, I am that man, the Son of Man, that the Lord promised would come all those years ago to Daniel. And the Father has given me all dominion and power. All authority is mine. And one day, you will join those who bow before me. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They didn't see this coming at all that Jesus would say this. He's, he's saying he's God. And the trial is over. He can't be this man. And Jesus ends up dead on the cross. This is amazing, isn't it? This picture that we're given, Jesus says, this is who I am. He has given dominion to the Son who brings his kingdom. He brings it in his death, in his resurrection. Not in going out to conquer the Roman Empire, or any empire. And that's the really shocking part. That the Jesus, the one that Daniel sees in his vision, doesn't gain his kingdom by greater force. More terrifying weapons and war horses. But it's through servanthood. Jesus explained it like this, talking about himself. For even the Son of Man, using that title, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the Son of Man. He says, look, you have an idea of what the Messiah has come to do, and you've gotten it all wrong. Let me tell you how my kingdom is going to come. It's not going to come as you think. It's going to come through service, the greatest service. By the way, I didn't come to take the lives of my enemies. I came to give my life for a greater enemy than you can even imagine. To give up my life for you. So Jesus dies to show us God's love and, and to bring us forgiveness and to connect us to his kingdom. To bring a new kingdom of love and light. And if we could see how radical this is. You know, Napoleon the great Roman, uh, French conqueror, explained it like this. He said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? 
upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. It's an alternate kingdom. It is, it is not like any of the kingdoms of this world that, that we look at or that we've ever lived in. And actually, he ends up giving his life, dying for his followers. And how does his kingdom come, you say? It comes in service. It comes in love. And this is the key to understanding the way the kingdom of Jesus will go forward. This is the true Salvatore Mundi, the savior of our world. And this is why we call this aspect of life at Granada living out grace. Because it's the nature of the kingdom of our king. And this, this is what God is doing in the world through him and our community. This is such a powerful change of perspective for all of us. How do you perceive Jesus as the Savior of the world? How is that going to happen? And, and how can you connect your life to that? Listen to the words of this old hymn, Lead on, O King Eternal. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease. I look forward to that day. And holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom come. I hope we see this. It is then that we might realize that, we are, that we're trying to do the wrong thing. We, I hear followers of Jesus who, who want to take over the kingdoms of this world. Even Jesus was approached by the evil one and said, look, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It is not like any of those kingdoms. He didn't join or start a political party. Though he himself was the truth, he walked in humility with every person. And it is my prayer that we will trust Jesus in all things, the way that he has brought his kingdom to bring life to the world through loving service. Now, this doesn't mean that voting and participating isn't, isn't important, but it means that we follow Jesus where he leads. And by the way, I, I look for pictures in our culture to see this, because this is where the kingdom of Jesus is advancing. It's what it's all about. You see, Rome was defeated because a group of people loved Jesus and followed Jesus by serving in their community. Not because they were better at taking charge or because they raised armies and took control. How can love and service change the world? Uh, Abraham Hong is a pastor who took his wife, she was pregnant with their first at the time, into the worst section of Cambodia. It's called Andong. It's a mosquito-infested swamp where the government dumps the poor that they won't invest in. They throw away, basically. Here's what it looks like there. They live in shanties made of wood and metal scraps, and disease is rampant. He's a pastor, like I said before. And so what did he do? You'll see a picture of him here, Abraham. There he is. He was a happy-looking guy, right? So what did he do? He went out to the churches of the city nearby, recruited people. They came and they dug trenches to drain the water because he realized how many people were getting sick. And then he recruited doctors and dentists who would come give medical care to those people. And dental care, they had never seen doctors and dentists Dennis before. He began to start schools where children could learn, and he lived among them as one of them, and guess what began to happen? The community began to change, and a different sort of life began to be manifest, to be different, and the worst part of the city became a place of hope where people would be willing to live. That's what it looks like now, and as I read stories like that, I think that's what began to spread across the world. This is the way the Son of Man saves the world, through the extension of this grace in deeds of love and mercy. It first means you don't give up on your world. You don't withdraw from it. It's not the enemy. And it also means that we throw away the false promises of seizing power or taking over or even the talk of changing our world. That's God's business. It's ours just to follow Jesus because only he can do that. We've reduced our world to politics and to activism, and I think we're looking for a quick political fix. That's not going to happen. 
I understand these things have their place, but their ability to shape our world in real ways is limited. Real life will not come in this way. It will come as Jesus brought it, in love and service. So the first Christians, as I said, didn't seize thrones. But here's what they began to do. In their lives, they began to renew every part of the world that was around them. They lived different lives. They had different relationships. They had different marriages. They raised different children. They served the poor. They went to places that no one else would go because Jesus would go there. They put Jesus first in their lives, and they did everything for him. And so they began living in the kingdom of Jesus right now. And what they believed was this. That prayer Jesus taught them, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, they believed it began in their lives, in their homes. His kingdom showed up there. And this is where Jesus' kingdom is coming today. I love the story of Eric and Lisa Purnell. Here's a picture of Eric. I chose them because they're like so many of our families at Granada. Eric and Lisa decided to go into the most, one of the most distressed neighborhoods of Omaha, Nebraska. It's called Gifford Park with one purpose, just to walk with Jesus while they're there. Become a part of the community. To be what you would call a faithful presence. And what would that look like? It would look like teaching ESL to the many immigrants who live there who are struggling to learn English. It meant organizing soccer clubs for kids they saw wandering the streets with nothing to do. It meant that one day as they walked across their neighborhood, they saw a lot that had become a a dumping ground. People would just throw trash there. And they, they sought the money. They raised the money so that they could turn it into a playground and use part of it as a place where they can do community gardening. It was a beautiful thing. You see, they didn't show up with a megaphone, and they didn't try to take, take power. They came wearing work gloves, loving their neighbors. And here's what happened. Once in their jobs, they made enough money, they bought a home in that neighborhood. And a beautiful thing occurred. You'll see a picture of their family here. There they are. Um, the beautiful thing happened. They bought their home, and they moved in in that neighborhood. And one of the neighbors came over and knocked on the door, and he was holding the key to his house. And he said, you know, we noticed that you bought a house in the neighborhood. You've been here for a while. Now that you own your own home, we know you really care about this place. We know we can trust you. And I wonder, what would happen if in every neighborhood we live, the people there said, we know they care about this place. We know that we can trust you. We're glad you live here on our street. The neighbors ended up asking to be the president of the Neighborhood Association Board. They lead, as I mentioned, kids' activities, playing games with them. They spend time investing in future leaders, and they invite people into their home to develop friendships and community. It's beautiful what's happening. And you ask, why? This is the way the kingdom of Jesus comes. The transformation has been amazing. And so I ask, as I think about that, How is God calling us to be people who are part of his kingdom? You as a representative of his kingdom where you live, knowing that this is how God is changing the world through our Savior, Jesus. Going to the places where it's dark, through loving service, the light is shining, building relationships, growing with your neighbors, showing forth the love of Jesus. This coming year, that's what we're going to be talking about. We'll be talking about ways that you can connect with this mission in the city of Miami and how right where you live, you can be a part of living out of the kingdom distinctively. Where do you believe history is going? Do you believe God and Jesus is going to redeem all things? I believe that. That's my focus as I think about life. That's, that's why I live the way I live. It's why I'm called the way I'm called. Do you believe that? You're part of that kingdom? Father, thank you for showing us this vision of Daniel that reminds us even when kingdoms, countries exercise such incredible power over the lives of people, they too are passing away. We know, Lord, just since Jesus was here on earth walking like we do, that so many kingdoms have risen and fallen. They don't exist anymore. But your people are still here, worshiping you and looking to you. 
And I pray, Lord, that you'll show us that we have a part of living out of the kingdom wherever we are in this city. And you'll show us what that means. And Father, we long for our world to be redeemed. We long for this kingdom of Jesus to come in all of its fullness. And I pray, Lord, that you will show us how we're already a part of that kingdom now and how we're called to live, live our lives as people who belong to him. And we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.